Hello and welcome to the Q&A for Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched, directed by Kayla Janice. Uh, my name is Leanne Kunji and I'm a programmer and manager at TIFF and I've been so kindly asked to moderate this Q&A by Kayla. I'm quite excited uh, to be hosting this for your directorial debut. Congratulations, Kayla. This is an incredible feat of a documentary um, that you've created here and I'm, I'm so glad to have this conversation with you. So. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, to be honest, you, you've been an incredible stalwart to the entire genre community for well over a decade now. You know, um, you uh, your writings, your programming, uh, your editing, your producing, uh, you've put on many hats in this world, um, and many of them have have uh, had a profound. Uh, influence, including your founding of the Miskatonic Institute of Horror. Um, and so my first question is really, what prompted you to turn your gaze to directing? Well, I never wanted to direct anything. I still don't really want to direct anything. It was kind of an accident. It was, so I work, my day job is I work for Severin Films. And I started off there as an editor of bonus features. I was in LA visiting, uh, which is where Severin Films is based, and we were planning the release of the, the Blu-ray for Blood on Satan's Claw. And so they were getting a bunch of the extras from, uh, I can't remember if it was Arrow or whoever released it in the UK, you know, often companies will kind of swap extras, you know, or they'll license extras from the other companies and stuff to bolster their own. And in this case, I, I just said to David, like, oh, well, are you going to make any new extras for it? And he was like, well, they just did all these new extras for the other release. So, you know, probably not. And I was like, well, why don't you have like a little documentary about folk horror or something? <laughs> and so then he was just like, okay, uh, okay, go do it. And I was like, do what? And he was like, <laughs> go, make the, go make the extra and hand it in by August or whatever. And I was like, and at this point, I'd literally just been an editor, which may, means that somebody gives me material. I edit it together to their direction, right? They're giving me notes and mm -hmm. then I do it, you know, make the corrections as they want. And that's it. I had not had like actual responsibility for like arranging the interviews and getting the footage and deciding what that footage would be and um, pr producing it yes. essentially. So you know, because I have done a lot of film programming, I've done a lot of booking guests for the Miskatonic Institute, like speakers, scholars, things like that. Um, I know a lot of filmmakers. I mean, I have enough contacts, you know, to be producing something like this. So when I handed in my first rough cut, there were 12 people in it. I mean, we were talking about like three people originally, you know, and now I was handing in something with 12 people. And not only that, but it was two hours long. <laughs> so my rough cut was two hours long which is longer than the movie, Blood on Satan's Claw. <laughs> and so David just said to me, well, is there a documentary about folk horror, like a feature documentary about folk horror? And I said, no. And he said, well, then instead of cutting it and making it shorter, why don't you just like keep going? Why don't you just like make a list of like, if you were making, hypothetically, if you were making a documentary about folk horror, who would be all the people you would want in it? And I was just like, Okay, so then it just became huge, you know, because, um, you know, originally because it was tied to Blood on Satan's Claw, it was very focused on British folk horror, and it was very focused on British horror, folk horror of a certain era, you know, so it was much more contained, you know, to the 70s. You know, I think that one of the first people I interviewed, the only non-British person in the first round of interviews was Robert Eggers, who directed The Witch. And, you know, so I had a few American films that were mentioned, like The Witch and Eyes of Fire, uh, but they're very much dealing with the sort of early wave of British migration to the colonies. And so they, they're still kind of connected to a lot of the British folk horror tradition and history. Um, and then something that Robert Eggers said in his interview, he was talking about the, the hair in the witch, the way the transformation into a hare and, and the whole tradition of like the hare as a magical creature and stuff. And he was saying, you know, we don't really have that in America, except, you know, in Native American mythology, you'll get like jackrabbits and stuff. And then I was like, oh, Native American 
I mean, that's American folk horror. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's that's so like so much of the stuff they're dealing with in British folk horror, with like the Christian religions sort of overtaking the pagan religions and building on top of them and stuff like that. It's like all that stuff kind of has its completely own story when you're dealing with indigenous cultures. And so then I started looking into like the Indian burial ground and all of the sort of, you know, ideas around that and the way that it was used in horror and stuff. And, but then it just grew and grew and grew because the, because America is so big that as you go around the different regions of the States, there's completely different manifestations of folk horror. And then also when you're dealing with indigenous stuff, indigenous nations are sovereign, right? So technically they're not Canadian or American. So there's some films in the doc that are indigenous or dealing with indigenous cultures that are technically would be considered Canadian movies, not American movies, even though they're in the American section of my doc. But a lot of that was just because I was looking at it like, well, indigenous nations don't have to be on either side of this border yeah. because they're soft, you know. It's a um, border, yeah. What's that? It's the manufactured border that, the, that they exist outside of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so much of the folk who are dealing with indigenous cultures is dealing with exactly those issues, right? Of borders and territory and, and remains and artifacts and ownership of these things and stuff, you know. You have this total excavation of land that's happening and then you do this global tour. Um, so I, I just, how did, I, I, as you're kind of saying, it just kind of grew and grew as you went on in this journey. Was there ever a point where you're like, I, oh, I, I have to stop, there's too much or, or how do I, how did you find the themes, I guess, to focus um, when you had that much information in front of you and that much history to go through? I think like when I first started, my interviews, I can like I can tell which interviews were done earlier because the questions I asked people were much more about like list all the important <laughs> movies, you know. And so it started off very much just trying to cram titles in, right? Like trying to like just get everything in and make sure everything's mentioned. And so, but as it went on and as it grew, each section or each chapter of the film kind of took on its own approach a bit. So it was kind of the unholy trinity had to have its own little chapter, which is Wicker Man, Witchfinder General, Blood on Satan's Claw, just because, and I mean, that stuff is kind of horror 101 for horror fans, but it's kind of important for anyone who's not a horror fan to understand like the impact of those three films. So there's a little section on that. And for each one of those films, I kind of focused on a specific thing about that film that would become kind of a hallmark or a signpost or something about that film that would then be influential later, you know? So in Witchfinder General, it was like looking at the relationship to the Western and the Vietnam War. And with Blood on Satan's Claw, I was looking at uh, the sort of youth culture and, and the, rebellion, the rebellion happening within youth culture at that time. Mm -hmm. And then with Wicker Man, it was looking at cults, you know, and the proliferation of cults and sacrifice and things like that. And then when we get into the British section, it is very much focused on what are the important films, who are the important creators, you know, in a way that the other chapters don't really do. The other chapters don't really get into like the Nigel Neals and the David Rudkins and, you know, the John Bowens and like these people who kind of were considered important progenitors of folk art. And so the British section is kind of like going through this list of like, okay, these are all the kind of foundational films that we branch out from. When people talk, are talking about folk horror, these are often the kind of first films that they go to, you know. Then the sort of paganism and occult section was really just creating a bridge between the UK and the US. And then the US, it goes kind of like region by region and how all the different settlement patterns and migratory patterns of the US and the different cultures that moved, you know, whether it's like German cultures or people from Africa or from wherever and where they settled, where they moved, you know, the people that moved into the Ozarks and Appalachia and the different traditions that they brought with them to those places um, and how that would show up in the folk horror of those regions. And then for the international section, we couldn't do 
that. We couldn't do a history of each country because it just wasn't possible because we'd probably touch on movies from, I don't know, 12 to 15 different countries in the international mm -hmm. section. And so we couldn't contextualize those films as well in terms of their local or regional histories. Mm -hmm. And so instead, this was actually my editor, Winnie Chung. Um, I had two editors on the film. Originally it was Ben Benjamin Shern. Mm -hmm. um, and then he had to work on another project. And so Winnie Chung took over and Winnie was great. And Winnie is now, she's a producer on the project also because she really put a lot into it. And part of what she did was really help structure the international section in terms of um, looking at it thematically, mm -hmm. you know, like instead of going country by country, which was like in my rough cut or my rough assembly or whatever of the movie, it was like, now we're in Australia, now we're in Brazil, now we're here, now we're here, you know. And she was just like, okay, that this just feels like, like a, first of all, it feels like a list. So Winnie had the idea of you know, separating it out by the, by the big ideas that were mm -hmm. coming up, you know, so we sort of have, like, we start off with psychogeography. And a lot of these are touching back to the earlier chapters too, right? They're ideas that kind of come up in earlier chapters. And then we're showing how those things all manifest in internationally. So we have like psychogeography, colonialism, surviving traditions, you know, surviving religions, um, shape-shifting, which yeah. was something that I mean, we could have brought it into the American section as well, because there's tons of shape-shifting uh, stories in indigenous cultures and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was something that in like Eastern European folk horror and Asian folk horror came up a lot. So we had kind of a little section on shape-shifting. Um, and then, you know, and then we kind of wrap it all up, you know, and so a lot of that international section was really about blending, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like even in the aesthetics of that section, there's a lot of blending. Completely, yeah. And I feel like because there is such grounding and, and references for things like shape-shifting films in North American uh, culture and, and films and, and what we've known uh, to be more popular, it was really something interesting to see it expressed in these different cultures in lesser known films and that it's weaved throughout their history um, of folk horror there. Um, and it has those those particular cultural considerations kind of, you know, when they're talking um, in the Asian horror section where you have the the, the, the kind of wailing woman and, and the idea of, um, you know, the, the loss of a child and, and these kinds of things and, and how that's expressed in Irish tradition with the banshee or, you know, the, all these, these different kind of markers of, it, it was really all tied together really incredibly in that section um, and, and created the sense of community, which is something else that's discussed pretty, uh, that's weaved throughout is, is the idea of community. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of interested in the community that you were speaking to. So there's interviewees and, and how they kind of saw themselves within the greater folk horror landscape. Okay, well, I think that the first people that I interviewed for the film uh, had either made folk horror films mm -hmm. or written a book about folk horror, yes. you know? So they, they had very clear ties to a general, like a general overview of, you know, um, of folk horror, you know? So uh, Adam Scavell, who wrote the book, Hours Dreadful and Things Strange, which, I realized that the name of my film was kind of telegraphing the name of my <laughs> I didn't realize that till after. And then I was like, oh, well. And uh, Howard David Ingham, who wrote the book, We Don't Go Back, which I also named one of the chapters after uh, the guys from Folk Horror Revival. And I mean, there are many people involved with Folk Horror Revival, like the web, the Facebook group and stuff like that. but. Some of the key people, you know, I, I interviewed uh, early on, and uh, you know, like some of these people have been waiting years for this movie to come yeah. out. Some of them have been forgotten we were in it, you know. <laughs> um, saw an announcement, and then they're like, "Oh, I forgot I was in that movie." You know? <laughs> and you know, so originally it was it was they were folk horror people, and it made sense to them when I approached them why I was asking them to do something folk horror related. I mean, there is a microcosm around British folk horror that exists that has like 
music and visual arts and you know so much stuff like all around that little bubble of those films mm -hmm. um and so a lot of the scholars and stuff that came from outside of that were sort of like oh no i guess i do see how my work is you know tying in with that like i thought of my work more as like rural rural gothic you know or something but i guess there's a lot of crossover with with folk horror you know and one of the speakers in the film william fowler who was one of the uh, curators of BF, the BFI Flipside label, which is like an amazing label. Um, but he, he said, you know, like a lot of these films that we've been talking about, you wouldn't see them connecting to each other mm -hmm. until you have a term like folk horror that brings them together under this umbrella, because so many of them are like so disparate, you just wouldn't see them as connected to each other at all. Otherwise, you know. Absolutely. And I and I mean, even the way that you begin the doc, you have these kinds of definitions of folk horror coming through. And I'm wondering if that those were born of a question of like, what do you define as folk horror? Or were they just terms that came together in your interviews? I definitely early on, that was the, the first question I asked everybody was how do you define folk horror? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that made its way into those kind of sound bites at the very beginning of the film. But originally that introduction was longer and it had more elaborate definitions, which I removed because it felt very, like there's a lot of discussion online about what folk horror is and not everybody agrees and people have totally different opinions on it. This is a vernacular culture right? It's like the people carry on this culture. The people decide what this culture is. The people decide how it evolves and what shape it takes. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because when you even look at the term folk, you know, the term folk was like invented by white colonial <laughs> researchers and, you know, to describe something that they felt was in the past mm -hmm. or you know, somehow not not civilized yet. Or it's like, oh, this is interesting how they have these little practices, you know. And once you started going outside of kind of anglicized cultures and stuff, um, their definition of the term folk and of the term folk horror were very different. Mm -hmm. um, and it just started to feel inappropriate to have these scholars at the beginning of the movie saying like, well, this is what it is, mm -hmm. as though they have the right to define it for the whole world, you know? And I just felt like, you know, I'd rather just leave it where everybody just gets their kind of impressions, you know, this is like, this is their impression of what they think it is. And I do feel like when you're dealing with, you know, film genres, or, you know, or modes or whatever you want, you know, whatever you want to call it, that so much of it is about impressions. It just makes an impression on you. It can sometimes be very abstract, you know? And so, yeah, so I just didn't want to have that like really strict definition where it's like, and maybe some people will, will watch it and not be satisfied by that maybe people will be like well i wish they really had stuck to this or that or had a stricter definition of what it is because it is quite broad in the film because it is quite broad in the film but i but i made it broad because all the people i interviewed it reflects all the things that they brought up that they consider folk horror, you know and so i wanted to have all those perspectives represented absolutely and i and i I, I see it as a challenge to the canon of folk horror and, and just kind of making us redefine ourselves what it means for something to be included in for under this folk horror umbrella. So I really enjoyed those moments of animation. I know you have um, from Ashley Thorpe and from uh, Guy Madden. So I, in kind of commissioning those animated sequences, did you give them a certain chapter that they would be covering or did you ask them, you know, to create animation based on their understandings of folk horror? Well, first, so Guy Madden was the first person I approached about it. And that was because, you know, he does a lot of collage work in his 
just like as a hobby, I think, you know, he had an Instagram page. I don't know if he still has it, but he had an Instagram page where he was often posting new collages, paper collages he was, was making. And I spoke to him about it and he was just like, yeah, I just find it very relaxing you know, to make these things. And so I said, well, would you be interested in making a couple of pieces for my folk horror movie? I said, one has to deal with landscape and one has to deal with the occult. And I'm pretty sure that's all I told him, <laughs> right? I was like, folk horror movie, landscape, occult. And so he sort of chose all the images himself based on that. But then it came out that he was like, well, I can make collages, but I'm not an animator, right? Yeah. So, so Zena Gray and Brent Rue, um, who were LA animators, they are a couple, but they also work together. Um, they offered to help me out in terms of the actual animation side of animating his collages. So he made like 200 collages. For the oh movie. my gosh. Like 200 <laughs> original collages. <laughs> Um, all of which are not represented in the film. I think we ended up using, you know, 50 of them or something, you know. Um, uh, and then for Ashley Thorpe, Ashley Thorpe is a very versatile animator because it's like he made the opening credits, he made the animation that's in the international section, and he made the like pop-up book, yeah. okay. all three of which are completely different styles of animation, right? Totally different animation techniques. Yeah, yeah. And so he was really great because he was super fast uh, and he could just do all these styles. And he also really appreciated that I kept pushing for it to look more handmade. And I just love animation. And I also felt like because the movie is so dense, it kind of needed the moments where you can just like, like <laughs> breathe for a minute. Yeah. There's so much information. It's a lot of information, and I really appreciated those sessions <laughs> um, for that reason. But it, it did help kind of, you know, the tone of mystery and the, the kind of cadence uh, of the editing and everything. There is, I, I feel like you really stay true to to those, to the folk horror theme throughout, so. Well, it's really down to the editors, honestly. It's like Ben, ben Shern and Winnie Chung, they transformed it, you know, from what I had in my rough you know, because what I had was all the information without that cinematic quality. Okay. It just felt like a lot of information. And it's, it's somebody suggested to me probably that it's because I'm used to doing books, mm. right? Like, because I'm used to doing books and laying out information in a certain yeah. way. And they felt like my rough cut or my rough assembly felt like that. I also feel like in some ways the film owes a a lot to Sean Hogan. Mm. Sean Hogan is in the film as an interviewee. He's the director of The Devil's Business and we always find ourselves in the sea and he's one of the producers on the 2000 AD documentary. But Sean Hogan, I think was the person who introduced me to a lot of the foundational British folk horror. Like, I mean, obviously like Wicker Man and Witchfinder General and Cloud State Spy knew all that stuff. But I mean, when it comes to like British television, like British 70s television, things that I didn't grow up with, things that haven't been released on home video in, in North America, mm -hmm. all these things that are uh, considered just like, you know, entry level uh, folk horror in the UK. But I didn't grow up with any of that stuff. And Sean Hogan introduced me to a lot of it. He played the Stone Tape for me for the first time. I think he played Robin Redbreast for me for the first time. Yeah. Um, so Sean Hogan, I feel watching movies with him was really what gave me the foothold to, to know where to start when I started making this movie, you know? As you said, it's this kind of amazing collection of, of people's definitions of folk horror from, from where they sit, whether it's a scholar, filmmaker, uh, you know, fam. It, they've really kind of contributed to this holistic view of the origins of folk horror and its evolutions and um, into modern times. And yeah, I, I mean, you still sit at the helm of this as a director and I think it's, you know, you, you had a lot of people to help you, but it was your vision that came together here. And I think it's a, it's a really informative and exciting one. And I feel like you've just educated a whole host of a new generation on folk horror. So thank you for that.